Introduction to the Kingdom Storm Starting from Prisoners of War Becoming a prisoner of war in a Roman military camp, waiting for Orville is a magical version of the ancient world that seems specious and has a tangled timeline. Numerous Roman wise emperors gathered together, the Normans of Northern Europe began plundering hundreds of years earlier, the successors of Alexander's great cause reappeared in Greece, Gaul erupted in a century-long national uprising under the leadership of a saint, the Germanic people were constantly pushed into Roman territory by mysterious nomadic tribes from the east, and the Egyptian queen relied on Roman power to return to the throne. Undercurrents surged under seemingly stable imperial rule. Citizens and slaves, self-farmers and landlords, Augustus and generals, senators and civilians, armies and wizards. Every contradiction is tearing apart this gradually growing yet bloated empire. Either choose to turn around and attack the internally and externally troubled Rome, becoming a national hero of the local people, or choose to save Rome and become a Roman hero that continues Rome. Before making these choices, Orville felt like he could survive first. Accessible Reading of Semi-Fictional Historical Texts Chapter 1 Surrender You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals window Ads by Google Push, Zhao Zheng opened his eyes in a daze, not his familiar big bed, but the gloomy and oppressive tent. Subconsciously, I wanted to raise my hand to wipe my eyes, but I found that my hand was also shackled by someone, and I could barely lift it up. Just as he was about to say something, a strong sense of dizziness hit him. The suppressed tent made him feel a bit suffocated, and he struggled to stand up, wanting to walk outside and breathe. Stumbling open the tent, I looked up and saw that there were tents like this all around, as well as campfires that can only be seen in movies and TV dramas. Where has this been? As soon as he had such thoughts, he felt a severe blow to the back of his head, and he immediately passed out again. When he opened his eyes again, it was already dawn, and the sky had just begun to brighten up, making the interior of the tent much brighter. Along with the light appeared memories from the original owner. His current name is Orville Tyrion, a young rebel leader who participated in the local uprising and ultimately failed to resist the Romans for a long time. Most of his comrades chose to die in battle or commit suicide, while he chose to surrender to the Romans. Now he is being held in a Roman camp, waiting for trial. If the outcome does not satisfy the Romans, he is likely to be unlucky. This identity may not be optimistic, but what is even less optimistic is the situation in this world. At first glance, the process of the world's evolution seems to be the same. The Romans were conquering the world everywhere, but Orville heard that a Viking named Lagna was plundering along the river in Gaul recently, Germany was a legitimate unified country, Egypt had a sister named Cleopatra in the south, the crescent fertile land in the east and the rising strong countries on the Iranian plateau in the east, and the Hindu kingdom in Asia Minor was fighting against the Romans coupled with frequent occurrences of magic, witchcraft, and supernatural phenomena in Various regions, Orville felt that being imprisoned had become a secondary issue. This world, resembling a breeding ground for witchcraft, was no less than witnessing an indescribable ancient god to him. Or maybe he had already witnessed the ancient gods to see such an abstract world line he waited in place for a long time before reluctantly accepting reality, and then began to think about how to escape, at least ensuring his life before anything else. After waiting for a while, a tall officer wearing ancient armor walked in and looked down at Orville. Orville knew him, named Nicanor Stilico, who was a local civil servant before the war and had known him before. Name and Identity Orville Tyrion, Interim Governor of the Mel Region Nicanor Protector, I think we are also old friends. Is it necessary to say such things, he said casually. Nicanor continued in a business tone, just answer Captain Vespa's order truthfully. Orville frowned to himself, afraid that things might not be optimistic upon hearing this tone. After asking a few more questions, Nicanor bent down to untie Orville's shackles. During this time, the other person's hand touched his neck, and a string of information suddenly entered his mind. Nicanor Stilicomuna's brave warrior, diplomacy. 
13 Military 15 Internal Affairs 9 Strategy 7 Education 11. Orville paused for a moment, then his mouth curled up uncontrollably, and Nicanor, who caught this, patted his head lightly. Don't tilt your brain, trying to escape like yesterday is useless. Orville nodded and said, can you give me a piece of paper? I have something I want to write about. Nicanor, who had an absolute advantage in force, was not afraid of him using his brain and gave him a piece of paper directly. He took the paper and pretended to write a few strokes on it, then folded it up and put it in his arms before being taken to the Central Army camp by the other party. On both sides are dozens of armored officers, while sitting in the center seat is an unattractive middle aged man. He didn't look as strong and straight as other young officers, slightly bald and hunchbacked, with some grooves on his face, smiling kindly at Orville. Are you the local governor? I have indeed been appointed like this. You're doing well here. There are six Parfi governors around here, and you're the only one who has been blocking me and my subordinates for over a month. Your soldiers are quite good, killing over 700 of my excellent soldiers in those fortresses, which really gives us a headache. His words were kind and there was no sarcasm or sarcasm, but Orville, as a prisoner of war, was naturally at a disadvantage. When this matter was mentioned, everyone present had a somewhat unpleasant expression. In Orville's view, this is also an inevitable thing. He remembers many people on the field who have fought against him in the past few decades, and many of their subordinates and friends have died in the war. He lowered his head slightly and began to speak his prepared words. I don't want to do that, but obeying orders in war is something I have to do. Vespa asked with great interest, if you don't want to, you could have acted more mediocre instead of holding us back for 40.7 days like you do now. Both sides have suffered unnecessary losses, and the hatred I have accumulated against you, the Palfians, in the war has made it difficult for me to restrain my warriors after breaking the city. Except for me, the remaining governors were recruited by nearby bandits and transformed into formal armed forces to deal with the Romans. People with impure bloodlines like me were not favored by the rulers of the holy city. Those despicable bandits would at most be punished if they returned, and no one expected them to stop the powerful Roman army. It would be more or less unlucky for me to go back, so I had to work hard to survive. Vespa grinned and the grooves on his face squeezed together. If I say that, even if I let you go, you probably have nowhere to go, right? As a Parfi, I submit to the king, and the priests did not establish a new king after the king was expelled. Now that King Aquitar has returned to his kingdom with the Romans, I, as a subject of the king, should continue to serve the king, so I cannot be considered to have nowhere to go. Upon hearing these words, the officers present either smiled with relief or looked contemptuously at Orville. Everyone knew that the king of Aquitar was the agent of the Romans in governing this distant land, and obeying the king meant obeying the authority of Rome. Vespa's smile grew even stronger as he said, then you may have to go through some competition. There are many loyal nobles like you, and many have already contacted us in advance. The court of King Yakita is already very busy. The implied meaning is that in order to survive, one must demonstrate one's own value, otherwise Orville may be left to the officers to vent his anger. After just experiencing a siege, they are full of anger. If that's the case, he will be more or less unlucky. Orville lowered his head and said, I have a defense plan for the holy city and I am also familiar with the military deployment around me. I should be able to help you. The original owner ultimately chose to surrender, not to mention that Orville had no sense of belonging to this world, so he chose to surrender directly. Vespa shook his head and said, I have all of these, and they are more detailed than your updates. A servant wearing heavy armor beside him timely took out a scroll, pulled it open, and showed the content to the crowd. It was a map with dense footnotes, which was extremely detailed at a glance. In this era, maps with such precision can only be used for military purposes, indicating that some high-dot-level officials within the holy city may have also defected to the enemy. 
The officers below seemed unaware of this in advance and burst out in surprise, then various compliments or congratulations emerged from their mouths. With this map, things can be much easier. Orville's face was not good. He thought he could rely on his intelligence to save his life, but he didn't expect the holy city warlords who were clamoring for war and inciting others to bleed to perform even worse than him. It wasn't long before someone colluded with the enemy and prepared to surrender. The original life dot saving trump card had failed, and the other party may not necessarily appreciate their little remaining property. Orville lowered his head, his mind racing, and in the end, he made a decision and looked up at Vespa sincerely. I have an important prophecy to share with you. If you are willing to believe me, please promise not to spread it outside and give me a more private venue. Vespa looked at Orville with great interest, his expression clearly indicating that he wanted to know what Orville was up to. He waved his hand to the left and right officers and said, you all heard it. It is said that the Parfi people are a nation good at prophecy. I also want to know if this is true or not, so let me hear it. I will share it with you at the celebration banquet later, and wait for my good news. Vespa's tone was somewhat joking, and a group of officers laughed heartily. A considerable number of people gave Orville a fierce glare and muttered a few vulgar words before leaving the camp. In less than three minutes, only Orville, Vespa, and his guard remained in the camp. Vespa nodded slightly and placed his hand on his chest, swearing, by the name and family reputation of Titus Flavius Vespasian, I will keep your secret during the war. Now please share your prophecy with me, I am looking forward to the surprise you bring me. Orville stood up and walked towards Vespa. The warrior next to Vespa had intended to stop Orville, but was stopped by Vespa. Orville took out a letter from his arms and handed it to Vespa, who also reached out to pick it up. The skin of both sides came into contact, and a string of information entered Orville's mind. Titus Flavius Vespasian was an ambitious politician, diplomacy. 20 military. 18 management. 21 strategy. 17 education. 17, Orville, whose conjecture was confirmed, squinted his eyes, patiently waited for Vespa to open the envelope, and with a smile on his face, twisted the letter over to show him the blank inner pages. Orville then stared into Vespa's eyes and spoke calmly, I am well aware of the law and how a general should die, but I think I should tell you the prophecy. You, Titus Flavius Vespasian, will become Caesar, the master of land, sea, and all humanity, and your descendants will become your heirs. I will witness the beginning of your great cause and experience all of this history. The guard's body couldn't help but tremble, and it seemed like he was desperately trying to hold back a smile. However, Vespa's reaction was completely different. His pupils suddenly narrowed and then quickly returned to normal. After carefully examining Orville for a long time, he finally caught the fear and confusion he wanted to see from the depths of Orville's eyes. Unconsciously changing his sitting position, Vespa returned to normal on horseback and joked, I'm already too old, and I come from a donkey dealer background, so I don't have the material to become an emperor. Hee <laughs> hee, you'd better ask someone else. Maybe some young furry guy can be stimulated by you, and it's uncertain whether he will become an emperor or a consul in the future. Let's talk about some practical things. I think you have good military literacy and can serve as a staff officer for Rome. You can serve as the acting commander of the 12th Legion as a staff officer, but personally, I suggest not to be too far away from your Legion commander. For your safety, there are some small contradiction. Orville left as if granted amnesty, and as soon as he left, the attendant immediately spoke up and asked, I don't think such a clown can give me any reliable military advice. Those who mention prophecy and divine intentions in the conversation at ZhaoZhuyuan.com, based on my experience, are mostly gods or fraudsters. Specifically, he should be a cowardly flatterer full of lies. The voice was not a deep male voice, but a bright and powerful female voice, which seemed quite out of place in the military camp. Vespa turned his head to look at the other person and said, Do you really think so? Leaving aside those prophecies, we will discuss this matter in the future. 
he did indeed block us for two months, far more powerful than his colleagues. The foreigners here are actually quite insightful in terms of law and ideology. I have learned about it during my leisure time in combat. As the local saying goes, never consult a coward about military matters. I think this is very correct. If it were me in his environment, I think I could hold you for about 64 days. Vespa shook his head repeatedly and said, so it seems that my decision was not wrong. He is your staff for this period of time. You know what the situation is with the 12th Legion, so try to protect his safety as much as possible. Meanwhile, use this time to observe and see if he really has that kind of prophetic ability. At this moment, the woman seemed to understand. Father. Are you saying? We will discuss this matter in the future. Now you are the commander of the 12th Army Corps, and I am the commander of this operation to suppress the rebellion. It's just that simple, don't think about irrelevant matters. I understand now. After receiving our salary, I will set off with you to continue our journey towards the holy city of the Parfi people. By the way, I would like to urge the cavalry of the 7th Army Corps to complete the advance task quickly and then set up camp in place. There is not much time left for us, it is very limited. Vespa rubbed the ring engraved with an eagle pattern on his fingers and murmured to himself, while the woman in armor quickly withdrew from the camp. Chapter 2 Revenge Seeking. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Ads by Google equals window. Ads by Google. Push, after being sent back to the tent by Nikaner, Orville was not shackled, which was probably a recognition. After the other party left the tent, he sat on the ground in a cold sweat, panting heavily, his hands trembling, but feeling grateful in his heart. Fortunately, he made the right bet. Firstly, he made the right bet on the style of the ability, which means that physical contact with others can trigger the ability. Secondly, he made the right bet on the opponent's approximate identity. He bet that this Vespa was similar to the Roman Emperor Vespasian in history, and after systematic authentication, it was true that the other party was an ambitious person. Only after understanding this did he dare to speak such rebellious words. If a loyal commander who was loyal to the emperor heard this compliment, he would consider taking care of the foreigners if he didn't break down the Orville carriage. At the end of the day, he wanted to prove himself to be a smart person and that his brain had value, which is why he said that kind of prophecy to the other party. Both sides understood that the so dot called prophecy was an excuse. When Vespa saw his ideas being seen through, he either killed the too smart person or recruited the too smart person. Fortunately, for Orville, who had no power or great control, Vespa chose the latter, and Orville luckily saved his life. After a delay of more than ten minutes, he basically calmed down, put on his black cloak, and walked outside the camp tent. As soon as the curtain of the tent was lifted, more than ten tall soldiers stood at the door, staring at him intently. Orville lowered his head, trying to pretend not to see anything, and slipped through the gap between them, but was heavily pushed back by the leader of the other party. He took a breath, obviously seeking revenge. Their comrades and even relatives may have died in his hands. Therefore, coming to seek revenge, although it violates military regulations, is also very reasonable. There was nothing to complain about in ancient times. As he was brainstorming language and pondering how to save his life, a bright voice came from behind the crowd. What are we all doing here? Welcome new colleagues. You're enthusiastic enough. The crowd froze and immediately panicked, turning around to salute, Captain. Let's just leave if we have nothing to do. Don't do anything that will affect your future. He is now considered your colleague. What crime is it to act on his colleague? Do you want the family to be ashamed? But. It is the general's mission to lead troops in battle, and seeking revenge for it is a cowardly act. Hannibal killed so many soldiers that he could still live in Rome and be accepted by Rome. Can't you even accept a Parfi? Laugh at him as a coward who surrenders and flatters. He is indeed so, 
but his heroic actions should not be seen as hostile. Mission and honor are absolutely the right topics of thought in Rome. When a superior says such things to themselves, the soldiers below cannot refute them even if they are unhappy. After being educated, they give Orville a fierce glare and reluctantly leave. After the crowd had dispersed, Orville could only take a good look at his life.Saving benefactor, who was a rare and beautiful woman in the military camp. The golden long hair is coiled at the back of the head, with fair skin and delicate and distinct facial features, giving it a youthful and beautiful appearance. Unlike the ancient world, there is another unwritten rule in this world that for some women with talent, they can live like men. Specifically, in Rome, it means having citizenship, assuming corresponding obligations, and having one's own name, rather than just having a family name as one's own name. After all, warriors with talent can easily defeat twenty or thirty big men, and those with spells or similar skills are even more unpredictable. From the perspective of attracting capable individuals, this is an acceptable measure. Obviously, this military commander is a talented person, otherwise it would be impossible to join the army and still hold a high position. I am Tia Flavia Vespasia, the acting commander of the 12th Legion. I will be your superior and protector for a period of time to come. You also know that you are not favored, especially in the location of the 12th Legion. Perhaps one more aspect of talent should be added, such as, my governor father, or, my consul father, which is even rarer than magical talent. I understand, there is a historical legacy issue between both parties. Is there anything I can do for you? The thunder of the 12th Legion was originally a nearby legion, and in the early stages of the rebellion, they were also the first to break out in battle with the Parfi people. Due to the mediocre former commander of the other side, who was lured deep by the Parfi people, the 12th Legion suffered a great defeat and returned home. Even the eagle flag, which was a symbol of the legion, was seized. This was a great shame that no soldier could accept. The warlord leaders in the holy city often pulled the eagle flag out to show off and patrol the streets, so Orville knew this very well and was not popular here. Tia's bright and divine eyes repeatedly looked at Orville, then honestly shook her head and denied, to be honest, I don't think you can help me. Find the book garden www.jowshuyuan.com, but this is my father's order, so you can follow me as my servant to better ensure your safety. Captain Arian is a very impulsive and energetic person, so it's better for you to have less contact with soldiers other than me. Just in case, can you ask, can you read and write? I can read and write Latin and the commonly used Aramaic here. I have some understanding of arithmetic, rhetoric, epics, history, law, music, and drama, whether it's from the Parfi or the Romans. I should be able to help you dispel some of the boredom brought by military travel. The other party clearly doesn't treat him well, and Orville is also very clear about his positioning. Not doing anything extra, being quiet and worry-free can bring some fun. Tia remained noncommittal and took off a delicate leather notebook from her waist, reaching out to Orville. The skin of both sides also made contact, and the other's message entered her mind. Tia Flavia Vespasia, a brave and magnanimous general, diplomacy. 13 Military. 25 Management. 17 Strategy. 7 Education. 23, she casually said, what happened to me today and what I need to deal with in the future, please categorize and remember for me. By the way, please change your gloomy clothes for me. You wear a cloak all day long, and it's the mice that can't be seen in the sewer that do this. It's frustrating to watch. As a member of the Legion, you should wear armor and military uniform. Thinking about the information coming from his mind, Orville cursed in his heart that the other person did not understand his taste. On the surface, he respectfully bent down and nodded, saying yes. P.S. Roast for some readers about why Latin people have the hair color of Germanic barbarians. Historical records show that Titus and Tumishan are really blonde, but here it is only partially in accordance with history. Although the jokes and nonsense have been repeated, it is true. Chapter 3 Mythology and Law 
You are listening at novelfull.audio. Ads by Google equals window. Ads by Google. Push, how old are you this year? Tia hesitated as she stared at Orville's clearly green and immature face. Orville had already changed into his standard military uniform, and it was only then that he understood what Tia meant. Orville had a mixed race appearance and couldn't tell which ethnic group he belonged to. This kind of person was common in Rome, and wearing the same clothes reduced his usual strange and contemptuous gaze. The people around him were more than one level of kindness. Twenty years old is already the age for military service according to Roman law. Does your custom allow twenty-year-olds to become governors? Tia was surprised. I didn't deceive anyone. I am indeed a descendant of a mixed-race aristocrat, with a small family fortune. People like me can't stay in the current holy city, and they didn't originally want to block the Romans outside. They just want to rely on the holy city, the strongest city on the east bank, to defend it. Sending me here and dividing up my property inside the city is a win-win situation. Orville spoke in a very flat tone, as if telling something unrelated to himself, which made Tia couldn't help but glance at him deeply. Next, let's go back to Caesarea. After a fierce battle, the army needs to be repaired, and then you will follow me to quell the pirates in the port of Joppa. The pirates there are attacking our wheat trade line, and we need to solve the problem before they interfere with the food supply in the big city. Yapa Port Orville raised his eyebrows. I've been there before, and it's suitable for pirates to hide. The coastline is full of reefs and cliffs. But for a larger fleet, it's not a good port, there's no place to escape the storm, and now it's not very good, it's time for a dark north wind. The original owner had a good understanding of the surrounding environment, and he was also able to keep it to himself. Black North Wind A storm formed by a magical reaction, occasionally seen on summer nights. Some of us believe it was the anger of the sea god Poseidon sea monster, and it is said that the beautiful Andromeda attracted Poseidon's wife's jealousy, so she was imprisoned in this place until Perseus rescued her and. I have read myths but they are also cliché d in meaningless stories about heroes saving beauty and their origins. I have grown tired of them from childhood to adulthood, Tia was not very interested. There will be storms in the summer here, is the news accurate? You can ask someone else, I'm not sure about the specific time, but there are several times a year, and that's absolutely true. Very good, I remember, this should have reference value. Tia waved to Orville, and he also wisely stepped down. After Orville was a little further away, Tia finally realized and whispered, did he adapt a bit too quickly. Military life was quite uninteresting for Orville, and after spending a few days together, he could feel that although Tia didn't like him, he didn't have much hostility towards him and still had a business-oriented attitude. Now they are not on the front line, and there are not many things that need to be handled by the commander. Orville follows behind Taya every day to take notes, occasionally serving as a tour guide, which is considered a good treatment as a prisoner of war. He is probably the most idle and least nervous person in the entire military camp, so he has a lot of time to observe things around him. After these days of observation, he feels that the Parfi people have lost fairly. Tia is a quite restrained person in her daily life. Although she has enough time to cook a decent meal every day, she always eats standard military rations. Hard dry bread, a drink made with fruit vinegar mixed with water, and salted water boiled fat. Occasionally, there are some local fruits and vegetables, which are served three times a day. Considering that this item is a standard accessory for every soldier, and looking at the situation in the holy city where Orville himself paid for military supplies, he now firmly believes that this battle cannot be fought at all. Calculating the outcome and gains and losses of the war, Mel was not far from the port city of Caesarea, and in a few days they arrived at their destination. Caesarea was a newly established city after the Roman conquest, with a completely different architectural style and planning logic from the surrounding cities, and was protected by thick city walls and a navy. During the chaotic period of the collapse of the Roman garrison, 
this city was not captured by the Parfi people and has now become a command hub for Rome in this area. The originally ten soldiers immediately relaxed after entering the city. Tia gathered these people in the square and symbolically trained them not to cause trouble in the city. Then she ordered more than ten heavy boxes filled with silver coins to be carried up, which was the salary for the soldiers. Shouting back and forth, these soldiers had good discipline and quickly received their wages. Apart from Tia and Orville, there were only a dozen or so young people hesitant to step forward on the field. Orville's emotional intelligence is normal, and he can tell what the innocence of a secret love is, but the protagonist may not necessarily be. Tia glanced at them with hopeful eyes, then hesitated for a moment before feeling relieved and said, you want to take the initiative to move the boxes. It's not bad. Then you can go and return the items to the warehouse. Each person will receive an extra dinar silver coin. When someone asks, they will tell me their idea. Most people left dejected, and there were also a few who were in a good mood when looking for the Shuyuan website www.chaoshuyuan.com. After all, a silver coin is not a big deal, and it's enough for a day's salary. Orville touched his empty pocket and glanced at the bustling street outside, whispering, Can I join in the glorious labor together? No, this place is not safe either, which means you don't have the opportunity to spend money and don't have to think about making money. It's up to you, sir. Orville gave up very simply. Where are we going next? Governor General's office, change into clothes and rest for a few days, replenish your personal belongings, and maybe take a shower or have a banquet. Rome is victorious, blessed by the sun god, it's a great arrangement. I wanted to experience your bathhouse when I was a child. Orville betrayed his faith without hesitation, and Tia rolled her eyes directly. She still couldn't accept Orville's exceptional adaptability. The so dot called rest did not last long, and Orville enjoyed a hot bath and a normal and sumptuous dinner. The next morning, he was dragged to the library of Caesarea to search for books on local laws and geography. Any food that is owned and grows on the land needs to be taxed. That is to say, unowned fruit trees and mushrooms growing on trees do not need to be taxed. Yes, sir. Orville nodded repeatedly. Tia frowned and thought, next sentence. Those who started as food will eventually become food and need to pay taxes. Orville translated one sentence at a time and spent the whole morning reading the laws related to taxation of the Parfi people. Fourth Palm Storm You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals window Ads by Google Push, until around noon, Tia stood up and put away her notebook, while greeting Orville, let's go, we're ready for war. I thought we would take a break this time. Trimming is for soldiers, not generals. As long as the war is not over, there is no holiday for qualified generals. Let's rest a little longer, and the fighter jets may slip away. The soldiers are almost here. The two of them came out of the library before and after, intending to leave directly, but a group of people gathered around the door, roughly four to five hundred, staring at Orville with fierce eyes, as if they were watching their father's enemies. They are not soldiers, but Greek immigrants living here. These Greeks have been in conflict with the Parfi people in recent years, especially during the rebellion. Racial hatred has become a common occurrence, and they both have blood debts on their hands. His gaze gestured for Orville to stand back, and Tia approached them and questioned, Greeks, why would you stop the Roman soldiers? The leaders spoke in unison, we undoubtedly offend the great Rome and only want the barbarians to pay the price for his crimes. He is the leader of the barbarians, so he must die. We demand that he be judged. Tia sneered, the trial has ended, and his life has been preserved. You are not judges, so don't use your Greek customs to guide the Romans. He was captured on our battlefield, and you protected civilians have no reason to interfere with our decisions. It's not gathering a bunch of mobs to come and shout, everything will be according to your will. If you are so independent, why don't you go and suppress the rebellion yourself? Why don't you fight with your own sword? 
Why don't you dare to vent your anger towards thousands of bandits gathering in Joppa port right now and find a powerless prisoner of war? Why do you have to humbly beg my father to eliminate pirates? Aren't you all big men with hands and feet? Thank you for giving birth to the Greeks of Pyrrhus and Alexander. Your ancestors once put pressure on Rome, and now you should be ashamed of your lack of honor. The west gate of the holy city has killed thousands of you. You are so brave, why don't you go to the holy city to judge him she unsheathed her sword, held it in her hand, and looked around at the crowd. Everyone who met her lowered their heads and remained silent like a cicada. After everyone made way, she put away her sword and made a gesture to Orville. The two of them left the library door and headed towards the square. As both of them were dressed in military uniforms and did not need to change clothes, they went directly to the square in front of the governor's office, where about 500 cavalry were on standby. The flag flown by the leader does not belong to the 12th legion but to the 7th legion. It seems that their mental state is good, but their clothes are more or less dusty and muddy. They should be troops drawn back from the front line and temporarily assigned to Tia for use. Orville mounted the warhorse prepared for him by Tia and left with a small group of troops. I don't think you can be a military staff officer, but when the local guide is barely qualified, I ask the Bachelor of Caesarea, and you're right. The Black North Wind is indeed coming. After the storm arrives, they can't escape by boat anymore. It's precisely because of this, they who have been cut off in the future are likely to quietly transfer from land. We need to quickly intercept and eliminate them in the port of Joppa before the transfer. Tia succinctly explained the combat objectives, while Orville pondered and began to recall information about the robbers. If I remember correctly, the bandit leader in Joppa Harbor is named John, John from the Limestone Land. Tia's military literacy is good, and the relevant person remembers clearly. It's not bad that he's not a local. He led a gang of robbers and a group of refugees to occupy this place. Why, do you have an impression of him? I used to face each other before. He had contact with John and knew he was being bullied and afraid of force. After some ideological struggle, he still chose to speak up and said, Sir, I understand what kind of person John is. Compared to directly stirring up his ferocity, I have a simpler solution. You can talk about it, but I may not necessarily adopt it. I am skeptical of your military understanding. As she said, with her father's request at the forefront, Tia gave Orville the opportunity to speak. The robbers in Joppa port have recently made a disturbing discovery. With Roman cavalry hovering nearby, although there has not yet been a conflict, everyone knows it will happen sooner or later. As the leader, John had someone go out to investigate the situation and as expected, he discovered the Roman soldiers building the camp. It seems that there aren't many people building the campsite, so there are two options in front of them. Either catch the enemy off guard before the Roman army arrives, or run away quickly. John had accumulated some confidence in his previous plundering of Roman merchant ships, and with the help of his subordinates, he slapped his head and decided to attack the unfinished Roman camp at night. So, thousands of disorganized and uncooperative bandits gathered that night and approached the camp set up by the Romans in the outer space of the town in the dark. The campsite was not completely built, only a few tents were set up inside the foundation of a few wooden stakes. Seeing this situation, John and others couldn't help but relax their vigilance. In their view, attacking such a campsite was easy. As they gradually approached the camp and prepared to launch an attack, a sudden fire broke out inside the camp, causing the robbers to panic and unsure of what to do. This fire seemed to have become a signal of attack, with the sound of dense hooves coming from the distant mountains and forests. The entire cavalry regiment of over 500 cavalry divided into three routes, launching attacks on these bandits from different directions. Although the bandits occupy an absolute advantage in number, they have not received special training at all, and do not know how to deal with the division and encirclement of the cavalry side. The dark night has increased their fear. They want to form a group out of instinct, but they are crowded together because of lack of training, resulting in no space to put out spears orderly against the enemy. 
the Roman cavalry was able to calmly draw out weapons, chopping at enemies like targets, and easily breaking up the formation of bandits. The huge casualties of their companions shattered the morale of the robbers, completely losing their organization and fleeing in all directions. Only John and his confidants are better, at least they know how to huddle together and turn their weapons towards the enemy. They stood closely together, slowly moving towards the direction of the town, hoping to use the complex terrain and the Romans to navigate. The cavalry seemed to have little interest in this group of people and instead scattered to chase after the defeated soldiers running towards the mountains, forests, and plains. A creature with two legs cannot escape a creature with four legs. Although there are some fish that slip through the net, most people are either captured or killed in place. John instinctively felt that something was wrong. He understood the principle of catching a thief and a king first, and these soldiers could not have understood. The Romans were definitely calculating something. But he had no choice. The only place nearby that could provide shelter was the port of Joppa itself. If the turtles were to move quickly towards the wilderness or scatter and escape, they would definitely be a dead end. In this way, they were driven into the port by cavalry like a flock of sheep. Fortunately, Yapa port had not yet fallen, and hundreds of robbers were killed from it, forcing back the cavalry team who did not want to fight. John and others were temporarily safe. After experiencing such a surprise attack, the robbers in Joppa port suffered heavy losses, and John and others were completely discouraged and dared not engage in direct combat with the Romans. The only choice left for John now is to run away quickly. John looked anxiously towards the coast, realizing that it was impossible to escape from the sea in the current weather. The dark clouds obscure the moonlight, and within the thunderous clouds there is thunder and lightning, as if there is indeed Poseidon's sea monster roar. Strong winds and heavy rain blow towards the coastline, and the powerful force of the storm can be felt from a safe distance. At this moment, walking by sea was tantamount to suicide, but John, who was scared out of his wits, couldn't care much anymore. He and his surviving colleagues spoke incoherently about the terror of Roman soldiers, and panic spread in the harbor. At this moment, Roman cavalry was found very close to the outside of the city. They did not intend to be just scouts this time, but kept getting closer to the town, which became the last straw to crush the camels. The bandits were timid before the battle, abandoning the vast majority of local residents and seizing ships to run towards the sea, hoping to carry on the reef until the storm passed or the Romans left. This became the beginning of tragedy. The power of the storm made them afraid to go deep into the sea, and the Roman army made them afraid to stay on the shore for a long time. Many ships were blown by strong winds and collided with each other, even hitting rocks. More ships sailed deeper into the sea to avoid the rocks, and were then engulfed by towering waves, putting these people in a dilemma. Many people drowned, many people are engulfed by the waves, many people crashed into rocky cliffs and died in despair, many people feel more comfortable dying under their own swords. Chapter 5 Outsiders You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals Window Ads by Google. Push, the next morning, the black north wind dissipated with the first ray of sunlight, and the coastline was filled with various incomplete corpses and ship wreckage. Even experienced soldiers rarely see this scene, their faces heavy for a moment, and not many people cheered and celebrated the death of the enemy. They all started collecting and burning corpses to prevent the outbreak of the epidemic. Orville must have never seen this scene with his own eyes. In fact, he was a bit scared and silly. He kept giving himself psychological hints, suggesting that this was just a part of history and that he could not change anything. After repeated attempts, he finally withdrew his trembling hand from his arms and pretended that everything was normal. Tia, on the other hand, looked at the coastline with some loss of focus. She glanced at Orville, who was still expressionless watching the play, and quickly regained normalcy before giving orders to her opponent. The remaining people in the city, whether women, children, elderly people, or adult men, are local residents persecuted by bandits and have not engaged in any hostile behavior against Rome. 
According to the law, these are the subjects of King Aquitar, not the rebels. We have a responsibility to protect the subjects of the allies and safely bring them back to other cities of the Parfi people. As for this place, in order to avoid becoming a pirate stronghold again, it has been razed to the ground. The several officers below exclaimed in admiration and awe, their eyes full of admiration. Yesterday, they still looked down upon this relative and believed that women should not go to the battlefield. However, last night, she almost completely wiped out the 2,000 bandits with 500 cavalry and personally commanded the cavalry team. With her long sword in her hand, she cut off more than ten heads. Even by the strictest standards, this was an undeniable victory, and Tia was also a capable general. The Romans did not dislike victory, nor did they dislike strong men. Faced with powerful generals who could bring victory, these Roman soldiers could change their attitude. Now, it is not a problem for them to believe that Tia is not an ordinary woman, but an incarnation of the goddess of war, Athena. Anyway, if we win this battle, it will be a big victory. The general will say whatever he says. Cavalry is always very valuable, and the rest of the dirty and tiring work cannot be done by them. Two other battalions brought many army slaves to clear the field, and Orville and Tia returned to Caesarea, where they received a warm welcome from Vespa. He was very satisfied with his daughter's achievements and even more satisfied with the successful resolution of the pirate threat. He even held a banquet for it, and Tia truthfully reported Orville's contributions to Vespa. Vespa was in a good mood and agreed to let him, a prisoner of war, attend the banquet. The banquet was held in Philippi, the current capital of King Aquitar, the ruler of the Parthians, and also a command hub. Orville appeared at the banquet and changed into the toga worn by the Romans. A type of oversized wrapping garment, often worn by later Roman philosophers in their robes. Strictly speaking, people without citizenship are not allowed to wear it, but this is what Vespa meant. He gave Orville an expensive toga and asked several servants to help him put on these difficult-to-wear clothes. On the surface, it indicates approval, but on the surface, it also implies a test. Not everyone can easily abandon their identity. Orville is probably one of them. So far, he has no sense of identity with any country or nation in this world, so these are labels for him. He can tear them up and replace them when necessary. Although this world is quite abstract, the Romans were still the strongest conquerors among the seven seas, and their financial and material resources were astonishing. Philippe was just an inconspicuous city on the east coast, but Vespa did his best to organize a decent and novel Romanesque banquet. Apart from normal livestock and fruits and vegetables, weasels, parrots, egrets, lynx, snake meat, turtles, camels basically, it's like setting up a zoo on the dining table, with everything from meat to internal organs to various strange and bizarre organs. Vespa came from a business background as a mule driver and served as a provincial governor and a governing official. His family was relatively wealthy, and hosting a banquet to win over his subordinates and restore morale was not a problem. As the highest commander on the battlefield, it goes without saying that he is surrounded by many people, and Tia is no exception. He is the apple of the eye of the old general himself, and with this victory, he has also become the focus of attention on the field. And Orville was convinced that the people around Vespa might be trying to be polite, while those around Tia were mostly genuinely trying to curry favor. These people were all turned off and went back to drink with their comrades in despair. Orville sat quietly eating in the corner, observing the movements of the people around him. No one said it explicitly, but Orville felt a bit isolated and not many people liked him as a surrendered general. He was also so happy and focused on eating. I didn't eat anything serious during the days of besieging the city, and later I also kept eating military rations in the military. Now that I can change my taste, it's naturally great. He didn't hesitate to drink, the only thing he didn't touch was the wine that the Romans loved to drink. It is said that they used lead containers to make wine, believing that it was sweeter and causing the lead content in the wine to exceed 200 times. He didn't know what the world was like, but for his own safety, 
it was better not to drink it. However, he is not the only person isolated on the field. Orville looked at the woman wearing a traditional parfait gown not far away, swallowed the leftover pork chops in two bites, and walked over to greet her. He respectfully lowered his head and said, Lord Belnice, it's an honor to meet you. May you always be young, healthy, and beautiful. Belnice was momentarily taken aback and scanned the young man in Roman attire before speaking, Are you? Governor Mel, appointed by the rebels, you should have some impression of me. Bell Nice suddenly said, Orville, who runs the olive oil business, I remember. Now. She scanned Orville's toga up and down, then instinctively glanced at her traditional attire, opening her mouth to say something, but the words eventually turned into a bitter smile. It is the Herod royal family who have wronged their subjects and caused you to be displaced, involuntarily. I am sorry that my brother and I were unable to stop those people in the holy city, and I am sorry that we did not have the courage to refuse the Romans' demands. The woman in front of her has a beautiful face, looking in her thirties, fair skin, no calluses on her fingers, and is well maintained. At first glance, it is clear that she is a pampered aristocrat. The only downside is mental exhaustion, obvious eye bags, and a worried appearance. Orville also knows that it is difficult for this Wong sister not to worry. The governor sent by Rome before had no intention of properly governing this area. He used all means to provoke conflicts between the locals and Greeks, and even personally burned, killed, and looted, which angered the local people. The Herod royal family is sandwiched in the middle and is not human. On the one hand, they know that the power of the Romans dare not tear their faces apart, and on the other hand, the servants are really unbearable. From the perspective of Orville, a bystander, although King Aquitar is weak, he has sincerely eased the relationship between the two sides. However, the Roman governor was simply a troublemaker, and all efforts were of no use. This kind-hearted Wang even disregarded her reputation and walked barefoot alone to the governor's office, threatening to dedicate herself to the governor in order to stop the other party's atrocities. Speaking of which, the other party still turned a deaf ear and continued to act recklessly, burning, killing, and looting, forcing rebellions to erupt in this area. In the end, the siblings were forced to burst into tears while giving speeches to comfort the people. Even crying could not fundamentally solve the problem. A portion of the moderate faction represented by the royal family was expelled from the holy city, and many people were even killed on the spot. The Roman legion made a comeback to suppress the local uprising, and King Aquitar also had to command some auxiliary cavalry with a sense of participation. Belenus had nothing to do and was placed here as a mascot. Orville couldn't bear any resentment toward such a kind lady. It's not your fault either. We can't change the situation. At this point, His Majesty the King should do something to quell the unrest and reduce losses as soon as possible. What you should do is give the people confidence, so we need you to cheer up as soon as possible. The refugees from Joppa port will be arranged nearby in a while, and they should need your care. After all, you are a member of the royal family, so you can give them some comfort and confidence. Chapter 6 New Tasks You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals Window Ads by Google Push, with this, Belinus' expression improved and she said, Thank you. I will ask Commander Vespa to let me go, and I believe he will not refuse either. If it were him, the governor of Galilee, there would not have been such a tragedy. Speaking of which, her face was a bit gloomy again, but in the end, it quickly returned to normal. After saying hello to the other person, Orville wanted to leave, but what came to her mind was to take out a close-fitting flat water bottle from her pocket. It's not easy to meet your fellow countrymen here. You should be serving in the Roman army now, and I hope you can stay safe, but danger always arises. This is water that I have blessed, purified, and sprinkled on wounds to heal. This is the only thing I can do for my people. The Eternal blesses you, and may you be safe. She stuffed the small pot into Orville's hand, and in her eyes, 
the child was also a pitiful and unfortunate person who, like a slave, could not choose her own fate. Even so, she still cared for herself and the royal family, and had a rare loyalty. Therefore, if she could help, she would help. She did not want anyone to die in self-destruction. Herod Berenice, the kind-hearted royal family, diplomacy. 14 Military. 7 Management. 13 Strategy. 7 Education. 16 Bloodline and supernatural powers are truly effective. The Herod royal family has been priests for generations, and there are indeed some supernatural powers that they have bestowed upon them. Orville solemnly put them away and nodded in gratitude to the queen. I will make good use of it. The reason why the Romans chose the banquet venue in Philippi was also very simple. During this rest period, Vespa obtained what he wanted. The official commission and permission of the king, asking him to help clear the rebels. Although it is a matter of getting on the train first and then supplementing the ticket, it still has legitimacy and does not fall into the trap of falsehood. The two nearby cities have been captured by a portion of the rebels heading north. With permission, Vespa immediately set off, leading three legions of more than 10,000 people around him. At the same time, he urged Tia to hurry to Caesarea and draw manpower from there. He himself took a step forward to besiege the nearest rebel city of Tiberia. It is worth mentioning that Orville was taken by his side this time, and I don't know what his plans are. The name Tiberius comes from Roman Emperor Tiberius, and Caesarea is similar, both of which were changed by the rulers of the Parthians to please the Romans. This city did not turn against the rebels during the most chaotic times. Although they did not resist properly when the rebels arrived, I believe they would not dare to resist the powerful Romans. With just one word, they could be forced to surrender with courtesy. In Vespa's camp, Orville talked confidently, but in fact, he didn't want to be the top bird at all. It was only after Vespa named him that he had to say so. Vespa still looked like a kind and kind gentleman, nodding repeatedly, would you be willing to be this pioneer? Orville patted his chest with a sincere expression and said, of course, after all, this is a recapture of the land, and I have no obligation to do so. But I still want to say that some cards can only be played once, and now those people in the holy city think I'm dead, probably using me as a model to worship the tree classic. To use a useful card for a battle that must be won, you need to weigh the pros and cons yourself, and I will unconditionally obey your orders. You're not wrong, Vespa didn't actually plan to let him go. He turned to another person and said, Ten husband Valerian, this task has been entrusted to you. Don't you always boast to us about your eloquence? Are you a young speaker brought up by a Greek teacher? Let's take a look this time. The opportunity for performance was in front of him, and Valerian naturally took on the task in a loud voice, preparing to conceive a surrender letter. In the afternoon of that day, Valerian and his men arrived at the outskirts of Tiberian city. They dismounted and walked far away to show that they had no intention of war. He walked to the gate of the city, took a deep breath, and loudly said, I have a desire for peace. Wait a while off. Before he could finish his opening statement, a team of soldiers with disorderly equipment rushed out of the city and headed straight for Valerian and others. Valerian was caught off guard and didn't even have time to pull his horse, so he ran away. The Parfi soldiers didn't chase too far and proudly led the horse back into the city, causing the Romans to suffer a small loss. Returning to the camp, Valerian looked guilty and said, it was me who tarnished the honor of the legion. When I saw the enemy not wanting to kill them but wanting to escape and retreat, it was an act of disrespect and cannot be done by a Roman warrior. Vespa waved his hand nonchalantly and said, I didn't ask you to kill, and your mission is not to defend your position. On the contrary, if you foolishly draw your sword and fight against hundreds of enemies, I would suspect that the Roman soldiers' minds are not normal. So, what you did was not wrong, saving lives is the right behavior. You don't have to worry about those horses, there are still reserves in the military. As for your own horses, please find the book garden www.jiaoshuyuan.com. 
I believe I also believe in your colleagues, and they will soon return to your side. Valerian was naturally deeply moved, and other colleagues were also deeply moved. Vespa took this opportunity to win over people. After finishing these, he looked at Orville with a gentle smile and said, It seems that your judgment is wrong. Under the pressure of everyone's gaze, Orville felt quite nervous, but he still lowered his head and honestly said, I still don't think I was wrong. Those are just a few people. The ordinary people here still love peace. Let's take a look again, Vespa said magnanimously, waving his hand as the crowd dispersed. That night, more than ten elderly people and nobles crawled at the feet of Vespa, pleading in various languages. That was just a few people's crazy and foolish behavior this morning, and it cannot represent the will of all Tiberian people. We residents have always been very friendly to Rome. Please only punish the rioters, we have long bowed to you and paid homage. Please don't refuse our request, the lives of tens of thousands of people in the entire city are in your hands. Vespa looked at the ugliness of these people and felt a bit lost for a moment, until his adjutant coughed to remind him to make a decision early, and then he returned to normal and made the final judgment. Rebels cannot be forgiven, but law-abiding individuals can be protected. Tomorrow, open the city gates to welcome my army and bring those thugs to me. I will allow you to return to the rule of King Aquitar and be protected by him and the Roman army. That's it. After submitting the surrender letter, these people left with great gratitude, while Vespa sat in his place, pondering over what Orville had said today. Chapter 7 Speech and the Future You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals window. Ads by Google. Push, the next morning, after a small group of troops explored the way to ensure safety without any traps, Vespa's large army entered the city. Unlike the agreement, the rebels were not caught, but most of them fled. The local nobles explained that they realized the situation was not right and had already left in advance. Obviously, Vespa did not believe this argument and believed that these nobles wanted to avoid offending each other, so he gave them a small warning. When the large army entered the city, he used the excuse that the city gate was too narrow and the time it took for the troops to enter the city was too long, which hindered the Roman plan. He directly had the southern section of the city wall dismantled, so that the army could enter and exit freely. The locals dared not speak out in anger. Perhaps afraid of being ambushed by the locals, or perhaps not wanting to disturb them, Vespa still set up his camp on the high ground outside the city, and did not rush to pursue the rebels. Instead, he watched the situation and waited for Tia's reinforcements to arrive. As a follower of Vespa, Orville saw all of this as unnecessary at first, as the rebels did not have an advantage in both quality and quantity, but later he understood Vespa's intentions. The rebels had no idea that there were over 10,000 people on this side of Rome, and thought it was just a small army. They organized troops in the nearby deep water city, preparing to confront the Romans. Vespa intentionally made them gather and then caught them all. Orville felt that this was the difference in thinking between Vespa and Tia. Vespa probably believed that it was necessary to eliminate the threat and eliminate all enemies. If it were Tia, she would probably think that beheading the leader would suffice, and the remaining people would naturally fall apart. Before the other party reacted, they would immediately carry out a swift beheading operation to end the war as soon as possible. After Tia's reinforcements arrived and joined forces with the main force, Vespa asked her to lead a battalion of 600 soldiers from the 12th Legion to disperse the enemy. At the same time, she also sent 400 cavalry and 2,000 archers. Orville and these people moved together and joined her on the battlefield. Orville looked at the commander named Erpius Turigen and tentatively asked, Do you have a son, and he wasn't born in Apennine? The other person looked surprised and said, How did you know? You're right. Orville chuckled and began to quietly contemplate how to establish a relationship with his family. I have said that I have some prophetic talent. Your son will become a good man strong and wise, and will become a great person. Based on the other party's life experience and his identity as a supporter of Vespa, 
Orville can confirm that he is the biological father of Erpius Nerva Turaginus, one of the five wise emperors of Rome, revered as the best leader, and best leader, with the potential to compete for the title of the best ruler in nearly 2,000 years of Roman history. Tiger sons usually have a dog father, and old Tura is also a very good general, a military talent highly valued by Vespa. No matter whether it's a godly speech or not, auspicious words are always loved by everyone. Old Tula is really in a good mood when praised, and his mouth is still humble, saying, for an eight-year-old child, these are all too far away, but thank you for your prophecy. I will remember it. He was transferred from Spain and has been following Vespa all along, not a local garrison, so he doesn't have such a big opinion of Orville. Even if there are some unspoken prejudices, they are not much compared to loyalty to Vespa. Even if the chief has spoken, then Orville is the staff and guide of the Roman legion. The two places are not far apart. When old Turigen and Orville arrived at their destination, both sides were gathering on the plain, and Tia was giving a pre-war speech to her subordinates. She encouraged with a loud voice, We have the best equipment. We have the best training. Despite the large number of enemies in front of us, we lack discipline and combat experience, and are just a group of ragtag people. Your daily training purpose is to defeat a large number of enemies with fewer troops. Victory has become a tradition for my father, and I don't have the face to face a defeat. Do you have the right to become my warriors? Do you have the right to become soldiers who embrace glory? I tell you clearly that this battle will end with a glorious victory, and we will reap far dot reaching victories, full of honor, and return home. After speaking, she raised her sword high in her hand, with a layer of red light attached to it, attracting attention under the sunlight. Tia pointed her sword towards the Parfi army, which had far more troops ahead than the Romans, and charged out ahead of her. The soldiers inspired by the speech, when they saw the commander dot in dot chief rushing towards the enemy, naturally did not want to be outdone. They formed a tight formation and then organized themselves to charge towards the enemy. Seeing this situation, old Tula felt a bit emotional and said, the eloquence of being a lawyer is good. Unlike us rough people, if I were to be replaced, I wouldn't be able to say anything, so just come up and kill me. The number of the Parfi people far exceeded that of the Romans, and they fought bravely. They were red-eyed and wanted to fight to the death against the invaders who set foot on their own land, but the gap in training and weapons and equipment could not be filled with a single dose of passion. Due to outdated equipment, it was difficult for their weapons to cause damage to the Roman shield and armor, and their coordination was not smooth. The soldiers often collided with each other with long spears, making it difficult to compare with the orderly formation of the Romans advancing and retreating. For a while, on the contrary, the side with a larger number of people gradually retreated, being beaten and constantly retreated. The Parfi people in the city wanted to pick them up and sought the Shuyuan www.jaoshuyuan.com, but the 2,000 additional archers they sent dragged them inside the city, making it difficult for them to come out and support the friendly army. The situation was quite unfavorable to the Parfi people from the beginning of the war. Orville was well aware that the biggest disadvantage of the Parfi people was the lack of cavalry. Most of the cavalry in the country was in the hands of the moderate royal aristocracy, and even if they snatched their horses, not many people could become qualified cavalry. In this era, there were no horses like stirrups, and training qualified cavalry was a matter of time, money, and racial talent. The Romans next door, holding shields, took hundreds of years to train not many qualified cavalry, and still relied mainly on hired cavalry. Old Turigen's cavalry entered and sounded the horn of the end. The cavalry scaled down the number of the Parfi people layer by layer like a fish, and their spears and short swords continued to harvest life. After the effect of the surging blood faded away, the fear of death emerged in everyone's hearts. They did not have enough resilience like professional soldiers. The sound of war horses trampling on corpses, enemies shouting and killing, and the sound of short swords piercing their bodies all continued to undermine their morale. At first, there were a few scattered people, but soon it evolved into a major defeat. 
these soldiers abandoned their weapons and equipment in order to run faster and quickly seek refuge in the city. Tia does not intend to attack Deepwater City with these people, even though the city is not very well dot developed and there are many areas without walls to cover them. However, their numbers are too small, and Tia feels uncertain. According to official history, Turijin should be around 13 to 14 years old now, and the plot needs to be modified by a few years. In addition, Belenis should be 39 years old now, and a character who has been feminized is 27 years old, all of which require a few years younger in the plot. It's just a casual mention when there's a big fight. Chapter 8 Not to be repeated You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals window Ads by Google Push, there were some changes in the situation, and not long after those soldiers collapsed into the city, flames rose up inside, mixed with some shouting and killing sounds that could be heard from outside the city. Looking at Tia, who was lost in thought, Orville thought to Vespa, who was commanding the camp from afar. He gritted his teeth and quietly rode forward, presenting his own ideas to Tia. I believe they are definitely in a state of internal turmoil now, and it's a good opportunity for them to work hard. What is your basis? Tia was also thinking about the same thing as Orville at this moment, but had not yet made a decision. The residents on these lands are all from the same religion as us, but the Parfi people still believe that they are barbaric descendants and their relationship is not harmonious. This is a rebellion by the Parfi people, and their relationship with us has not been good enough to be united. It is normal for them to have conflicts. Tia is a decisive and courageous person in the military, and with Orville's words confirming her ideas, she dares to take action. But before that, Orville stopped her and said, I hope you can give me a shield and a horn. I want to go to the forefront of war with you. Orville's initiative made Tia somewhat uncertain, but she nodded in agreement with Orville's request and ordered her subordinates to give him a large shield and a loud horn. Orville's equestrian skills are not exquisite, but to a certain extent, this shield is a large shield that is over one meter high and half a meter wide. It is perfect for infantry to use, but it is quite comical to use it for horsemen. Orville crouched on the back of his horse, carrying his shield behind him in a disheveled manner like a turtle shell. He didn't hold any weapons in his hand, but instead clenched his horn tightly, and so he went to the battlefield with Tia. Tia raised her sword high above her head again and said, Soldiers! Citizens! Men of the Tiber River! Now is our good opportunity! Do you hear the chaos inside? This indicates that the enemy is about to become our bag. Seize the opportunity and we will rush in. After a big victory, the morale of the Romans, who had surged, undoubtedly had him and followed Tia to charge again. They marched along the lakeshore, crossed the shoals, crossed the city's defenses, and rushed in from areas where the city was not defended. Tia took the lead in charging into the city, and the already low morale defending soldiers were directly frightened. Without making any decent resistance, they began to flee. Tia and others knocked over several incoming soldiers and rushed towards the city with great force. A considerable number of people fled to the lake, but there were also many who chose to stay in the city to resist or hide, which led to tragedy. The soldiers who had turned red-eyed couldn't care too much, and the local residents were mixed up with foreign rebels. Many soldiers also had plans to rob while in chaos. At first, they only killed a small number of people by mistake, but soon it turned into indiscriminate slaughter. The soldiers kicked open the door, killed the residents, searched door dot to dot door for property, and searched for possible enemies. Tia was also a bit panicked when she saw this situation. Her plan was only to eliminate the enemy, and the massacre of civilians was not part of the plan. At this moment, Orville reluctantly poked his head out of the shield, looked around for a moment, and then lightly tapped Tia. Do what you should do. After saying these words, he didn't care how Tia responded, he just blew the horn. The long and resounding sound lingered in the urban area for a long time. After years of military camp life, 
the soldiers reflexively stopped their movements, either looking towards the direction of the sound or thinking that an enemy was attacking, and ran directly towards the direction of the sound. The originally noisy sounds on the field were suppressed and fell silent for a moment. Tia was momentarily stunned, but quickly realized that this was an opportunity created by Orville. She took a deep breath and gathered the strength inside her body, shouting loudly, all local residents or surrenderers should abandon their weapons and come out of the houses, raising their hands and squatting on the ground. As a Roman officer, I guarantee your life safety. At the same time, all soldiers must abide by my orders, not to attack surrenderers and civilians, not to plunder property in an disorderly manner, otherwise it will be a rebellion. The winner's honor and spoils of war will be deprived. On the one hand, these people also knew how to obey orders, and on the other hand, the punishment for disobedience in Rome was indeed severe. After the command of a high-dot-ranking commander, the situation that had originally been out of control was immediately brought back on track. These people are not without everything. Tia is now leading the most elite and core heavy infantry, composed of serious Roman citizens. They are not proletarians but wealthy self-farmers with their own land, and some even come from landlord backgrounds. To put it another way, they are basically, good sons, one of the highest quality soldiers in the ancient world. The cost of making mistakes is higher for them, and there is no need to sacrifice their wealth and honor for a little money. If mercenaries and light infantry were to come, Tia might not be able to hold everyone down. Orville was the horn that sounded just because he knew this. If the composition of this army was too mixed, Tia's warning would probably not have a complete effect, and it would actually affect her own credibility. Soldiers formed small teams to search for residual enemies door by door, and civilians and surrendered rebels were gathered in the square to wait for disposal. After everything gradually settled, Tia felt a little more at ease. She glanced at Orville, who had been holding a shield and following her cautiously, fearing that something unexpected might happen. She also felt a bit helpless, but this helplessness quickly turned into doubt. She didn't want questions to accumulate in her heart, so she asked directly, you didn't have to participate in the battle, and I can see that you didn't want to. But why did you come this time just to sound the horn? Orville raised his left horn and nodded in agreement, I'm not interested in fighting people. I've never received such training since I was young. The experience I've learned from the olive oil business is to minimize losses after failure. I'm doing this, and those people don't need to die, and there will be more people dying in the future. From the perspective of preserving the vitality of this region, it's better to die fewer people. Let's not take it as an example. Blowing assembly numbers indiscriminately is a serious violation of military regulations. This time, let's consider the situation urgent. You did the right thing. Tia nodded slightly, acknowledging Orville's statement that she had never been kind on the battlefield, which was cruel to her subordinates. However, it was better to have fewer deaths outside the battlefield. She was tired of watching the bloodshed, but it was impossible to stop. They were in a state of war almost every year in their long history. Vespa reacted quickly and made a decisive decision upon learning that Tia had entered the city. He surrounded the deep water city with his men and did not let go of any rebels. Anyone with the intention of leaving the city was killed on the spot. The remaining rebels also have no way out and can only take advantage of the situation by taking small boats to the lake for refuge. Chapter 9 Introduction You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals window Ads by Google Push, Deepwater City is adjacent to Lake Neller, hence its name. The lake has a relatively large area, enough for many people to take refuge on it by boat. But Vespa is not a bandit who snatches a wave and leaves, he has time to spend slowly with the rebels. Vespa doesn't have the eloquence and speaking habits of his own daughter, his commands are simple and intuitive. Surround the entire lake, set up an inspection team, kill the surrendered prisoners who fled, and at the same time, organize personnel to start making rafts to clear the rebels with rafts. The orders were faithfully implemented, 
the rebels were trapped on the lake, and the experienced Romans began cutting down trees to make rafts. Orville watched coldly, silently recording the process of the war in the notebook that Tia had given him. Leaving the city, it is impossible for the rebels to wait for reinforcements. In fact, they are at a dead end. They could only watch helplessly as the Romans quickly completed the raft within a few days and then drifted to the lake to begin their campaign against them. The Romans lined up their rafts and sailed towards the enemy. Most of the rebel ships were fishing boats, not very large or stable, and could not support them in a water battle with the Romans. There were not many people on each small boat, and they dared not engage in close combat with the Romans on interconnected rafts. They could only rely on their flexibility to circle around the rafts, throw stones or anything they could throw at the Romans, and occasionally drive the boat past the rafts, attacking them with weapons from close range. All these efforts have had little effect, with stones facing armor and shields almost ineffective. Whenever ships approach rafts, it is often the rebels who are killed by javelins, bows and arrows, and Roman short swords. More Romans jumped onto small boats and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, lacking training and enduring several days of agony. They were no match at all. Someone attempted to break through, but the Romans were close enough to stab them with a javelin. Their ship was caught by the Romans and easily destroyed. If anyone who falls into the water pops their head out of the water, they will be attacked by bows, arrows, and javelins. In desperation, some people attempted to climb onto the raft, but the Romans directly used their short swords to cut or stab their hands and heads. A large number of Parfi rebels were killed, and the remaining people were also driven to the shore. The Romans did not intend to show mercy this time, and no one would become a prisoner. In Vespa's view, they had already provided many opportunities. Many people are killed while waiting on the shore, and many are killed by idle infantry after climbing onto the shore. Even if they narrowly break through the infantry's defenses, cavalry teams patrol back and forth a terrifying sight appeared before Orville's eyes. The entire lake was stained red with blood, and corpses were everywhere on the lake or land, and these people had never survived. Two days later, inside the military camp, Tia took Orville to meet Vespa. General Vespa, I believe it is necessary to clean up the bodies in the lake now. It has been two days now, and if left unattended, it may cause a plague. Vespa didn't immediately look down at Tia, but instead looked at Orville with questioning eyes. That roughly means. Was it your idea? Orville shook his head slightly, while also looking at Vespa with sincere eyes. Vespa can also understand. Although it's not my idea, I think so too. After pondering for a few seconds, Vespa spoke up and asked Tia, my daughter, why do you think I didn't take any action? After this period of fighting and movement, the army needs a brief rest. At the same time, it is necessary to show some dignity and let them take a good look at what the rebels' fate is. Vespolo nodded and said, that's right, that's right. It's not enough to just eliminate the rebels. In ten or twenty years, they may make a comeback, and will have to pay the blood of citizens to suppress the rebellion. So I want to solve the problem once and for all, so that the people here can't resist Rome at all. There may be more sacrifices for this, but in the long run, it's undoubtedly beneficial for us and not necessarily bad for the locals. I understand your thoughts, but if there is an outbreak of the epidemic, no one will benefit. Our soldiers and allies live nearby. I don't intend to use this method to deal with the locals either. Our soldiers are enough to defeat any enemy head. On, and we don't need to use this inferior method. It's just that I still have some problems now. Vespa rubbed his ring and rhythmically tapped the armrests of the chair with his knuckles. He looked up at Orville seemingly unintentionally and said, Do you want to restore your governorship? Orville thought seriously for a few seconds, then shook his head and refused. I am too fragile and don't have enough courage to make some decisions. So if given the choice, I would like to leave the land of Parfi after the war and become a small wealthy businessman or farmer in Rome or Alexandria. A life of blood and sword is not very suitable for me. 
Vespa discussed the bloody suppression of his tribe in front of him, but Orville's reaction was as usual, not angry or emotionally disturbed, simply answering questions. For now, if he is allowed to truly immerse himself in this dark era, his morality and values may not be able to withstand it. Looking for the Shuyuan website www.chaoshuyuan.com will cause him to collapse first. Slaves, massacres, famine, bandits, epidemics everything is not just a historical term, it is truly presented to Orville. If we look at all of this from the perspective of modern people's three perspectives, Orville will have tremendous psychological pressure. However, it is not easy to completely abandon what has been experienced and learned in the past twenty years within a few days. The expedient he chose for himself was to evade, implying that everything was unrelated to him and that as a spectator, he could not change anything. He is well aware that once he holds power, he can no longer hypnotize himself and must make a choice. Whether to integrate into this world or persist in preserving the original world. He doesn't want to make this extremely difficult choice yet, so he can procrastinate as long as he can. If he can procrastinate this life without worry, he can actually accept it. Vespa is also an experienced person, although it is impossible to guess that Orville is a traveler, one can still guess 70.8% from his expression and speech. His eyes moved back and forth between Orville and Tia, and in the end, he made his own decision. Tia, you're right. It's almost time to deal with those corpses. Although the residents of Deepwater did not surrender to Rome in the first place, they can make up for it through practical actions. Let the people of Deepwater handle the corpses themselves, pick them up, and burn them. I will have a team of 100 people come over to assist as punishment, which will surely leave a deep impression on them. At the same time, to demonstrate their determination to stand with Rome, they had to pay a blood tax as proof. Recruit 600 people from the residents of this city as auxiliary troops to assist us in our activities. As for the commander, they will be under the command of your army, and Orville Tyrion will be responsible for recruitment, training, and organization. How about this? Chapter 10 Blood Tax You are listening at NovelFull.audio Ads by Google equals Window Ads by Google Push the so-called blood tax is a form of tax payment that replaces grain, cloth, or money with military service. In other words, some local people are required to serve in the military, shedding blood for the country, hence the name. Objectively speaking, soldiers from both sides fighting on the same front may indeed be beneficial for easing the relationship. Sending someone to join the Roman army not only allows them to recognize the power gap, but also serves as a declaration of allegiance, clearly stating that they have nothing to do with the rebels. Regarding these considerations, Tia is not sure how much she can understand, but the result does align with her thoughts, so she did not refuse. I think this is quite good, you have considered more carefully than me. Orville was a bit eager to offer his opinion, but it was also difficult to speak up. He is such a defeated general, it would be good if he were not placed under custody elsewhere. Vespa trusts him so much, even if it is just a mixed army of a few hundred people, it must be guaranteed by his own reputation. If something goes wrong, Vespa will be the first to be affected and leave a handle on his political opponents. He doesn't mind the risks he takes, and Orville can't justify anything else. He still doesn't really want to get involved, but now it's difficult for him to get out of it. Just follow the example of Cincinnatus, and after the war is over, you can immediately surrender and return to the countryside, living a life of landlords with a large sum of money. Although he didn't believe it himself, Orville still tried to hypnotize himself to accept the established reality. In the end, Vespa turned his questioning gaze to Orville and said, What's your opinion? I respect your wishes. You can go to war without leading troops, and command during war can be handed over to Roman soldiers or local soldiers approved by the commander. You trust me so much, so naturally I cannot refuse. I will do my best to complete the task. Orville was well aware that Vespa wanted to drag himself onto a pirate ship. As long as he participated in actual military affairs, he was basically bound to the Roman army, 
so he was also mentally prepared to put himself on the battlefield. After the confirmation of the large needle, the specific implementation should not be done by Vespa himself, leaving him sitting in the camp muttering to himself. Having a good brain, having little influence, and having little ambition. I just don't know exactly what my abilities are, they won't be too bad. If everything is just right, wouldn't it be a bit too clever? Do people who possess all these qualities really exist? After the war, the stench of corpses enveloped the entire area, and the beaches were filled with wreckage and swollen corpses. Under the scorching sun, the air also became murky. In this situation, several teams of people were riding on the remaining rafts of Rome, trembling on the ship to salvage the bodies. Their goal is to collect the bodies to the shore for cremation, in order to avoid a plague. Doing this requires some professional skills and strong psychological qualities, which is still a heavy task for these civilians, but they have to do it. Nearly 20,000 Roman troops were stationed on their faces, and they had just killed possibly thousands of people using this method. They were almost stunned by the scene and couldn't resist the idea of rejecting the Romans. The local envoy sent by the Romans assured them that as long as they personally cleared the bodies on the shore and in the lake, and sent 600 soldiers to join the army, the Romans would not take any responsibility for their tacitly condoning the rebels, but also try to ensure the integrity of their property. This was already a near amnesty for them, and there was nothing to complain about. Soon, they organized manpower to start cleaning up, and the progress was also very satisfactory. Faced with the fear of death, these people easily overcome the fear of the deceased, which is also very interesting. Turning his gaze to Orville's side, since he had taken on the task from Vespa's side, he naturally had to do his best to complete it, especially since this task was suitable for his own abilities. The Crude Fisherman of Bede in Deep Water City, Diplomacy 11 Military 14 Management 8 Strategy 9 Education 6 John the Cunning Hunter of Deep Water City, Diplomacy 11 Military 12 Management 9 Strategy 13 Education 10 Vespa discovered that his own abilities were not something that could be activated by encountering people. The prerequisite was to know the other person's name, which was a conclusion obtained through repeated verification. The average ability of an ordinary person is about 10, and if the children of the nobility have received a complete education, they will generally be slightly stronger, mainly due to the bonus points of knowledge, usually ranging from 12 to 13, and the difference will not be too large. The data is sometimes updated, as abilities also increase and decrease with age, but the vast majority of people do not have significant differences and generally take shape in adulthood. The system provides real-dot-time feedback, but the downside is that it does not display a person's personal combat ability, only the so-dot called military strategy ability, which is not very convenient for selecting soldiers. Fortunately, after so many years of accumulation, the Romans also had a set of methods for selecting soldiers, such as searching for the book garden www.jowshuyuan.com, which is why Orville brought the Roman soldiers together. The one who came to the city with him was the decadent Valerian, the one who had been chased and abandoned his armor before. Perhaps to make up for his lack of honor, he volunteered to cooperate with Orville. Valerian Gallienus, curious soldier seeking victory, diplomacy. 14 Military 13 Management 16 Strategy 10 Education 18 Actually, Vespa has a reason to be optimistic about him. This soldier has good abilities, but he's a bit unlucky. He was examining the body of a hunter from side to side, ensuring that he was suitable for combat, had sufficient strength and endurance. Previously, Vespa mentioned that he was a child taught by a Greek teacher. As a Roman living in Italy, being able to afford a Greek tutor indicates that his family is in good condition. In this era, Greek teachers were widely recognized as the most authentic teachers in the Mediterranean world, with the highest level of teaching, the most profound knowledge, and the most expensive natural prices. It was difficult for ordinary landlords to afford formal Greek tutors. Perhaps it was to take care of Orville's emotions, 
and he didn't explicitly say it, but judging from his skillful and flowing movements, he doesn't seem like a beginner. It's very likely that his family is in this business, and Orville is not sure. Anyway, he can help himself now. Orville focuses on individuals with outstanding military and management skills, prioritizing single men for simple reasons. Firstly, he felt that he might not necessarily stay and develop in this place in the future. His subordinates were not worried about the most convenient thing, and were more able to leave at will. He is not sure how long this unit will be with him, but his long-term plan is always right. Secondly, if one needs to move, arranging marriage for subordinates can become a good bargaining chip. Firstly, it can tie down men, and secondly, it can establish good relationships with locals.